and proceed back to the to the main hall. So, and Patrick Lichty, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Lichty. I'm a visiting ass assistant professor at the University, American University of Georgia, and today I'm going to talk about uh, slow scan television, reviving and archiving a medium, and my new archive that I'm coming up with that uh, I hope that you'll be interested in. So let's get going. Um, so I like to say um, there's a medium that I fell in love with in 2005 when I attended the first uh, Media Art Histories conference refresh and um, some friends of mine from Vancouver and uh, Victoria Todd Davis, Doug Jarvis and Jeremy Owen Turner gave a uh, presentation um, on their on their outer space uh, slow scan t uh, TV history project. And the, uh, the history described the development of uh, telematic art projects that occurred in Victoria and uh, Vancouver, British Columbia um, at Open Space and Western Front, um, primarily through the efforts of uh, Bill Bartlett and um, um, Hank Bull, who's actually showing at uh, the, the one of the, at the, at the uh, Confederate Gallery at UCAMP right now. So um, as I said, these uh, the series of interventions were held uh, that at, in, at Open Space and Western Front uh, in uh, Vancouver and also at Pender Island because that's where Bill Bartlett was. So to say that these, you know, were held in part is that these were telematic. They were in, you know, early networked pieces. Um, so they were performed across telecommunication, telecommunications networks and included numerous artists, including um, Robert Adrian X, who this um, who just passed on, who this is uh, dedicated to, by the way, and um, Heidi Grumman in Vienna, Kozui uh, Kabata in Japan, and many other people. So, but my entry point to this body of work, of you know this this um, uh, kind of like video modem work that uh, takes uh, black and white images at really low resolution and transmits them across phone lines, or now I'm doing some Skype work, um, at one frame every seven seconds, and it goes. And that's, you know, that's why they call it slow scan. So, um, so as I said that, you know, I'm, I'm primarily entering this work through the Western Canadian artists and, um, and, uh, and Bob Adrian, and Actually, most of the archival material for this body of work is in Western Canada, and uh, I'm going to go back there um, in, the, in the summer to uh, really kind of further populate the archive that I'm doing. So this is all, you know, leading to my founding of uh, the Slow Scan TV Open Archives, and it's a project devoted to uh, creating a repository for this study of uh, this niche of media. So. Really what I'm looking at here is that I'm not talking so much about slow scan television art, but um, as much as methodologies about, you know, the discovery of research and archival methods for a particular media art history and how they're, they systematically resi revealed themselves to me up to this point. So as I said before, I want to thank Hank Bull and Bill Bartlett um, for giving me um, initial archival material. So. Um, Media archaeological practices, as described by Parika and others, describes a heterogeneous set of uh, practices, including cultural material and technical discourses, practices as diverse as circuit bending and uh, cultural resituating of, uh, of, of technologies through the revival of the dead. Um, so these go beyond lists like Bruce Sterling's media, Dead Media Project in the 1990s, which I took part in. Uh, but creating approaches that include, include decoding, restoring, circuit mending, and remixing of records generated by technology, the media, and the technology that um, underpins it. For me, also crucial to studying this, it's to consider, you know, all this as a multivariant situation consisting of material, social, and cultural, uh, cultural and technological deponent, components. So media archaeology through these methods reveals radical histories that, for me, are freeing and challenging. The freedom comes from the radical plurality of tools available to the media archaeologist and explosion of possible epistemic trajectories. 
these demand that a certain craft of discourses are engaged to shape the research, um, you know, create uh, creative research methods that transcend notions like, you know, Foucault's problematization of the archive and new historicism. So my research in resurrecting this, this uh, dead medium um, and creating of a historical archive takes uh, a tiered architectonic approach. So in this, I had to um, create, I had to get technology as artifact to uh, create, to do hardware studies. And I had to ter determine its, uh, its in instrumentality and um, create a workflow through doing new creation, doing new work that I showed at uh, Transmediala and um, engage in antiquarianism through the decoding of signals and archiving of resulting movies and the discovery of archived ephemera. So for me, it was necessary to research the technological basis of the work, its function, and the creative gesture of the technology before setting around uh, approaching artists like uh, Bull and Bartlett to attempt to archive this work. So the vector acquiring the means. For me, the next step in, in, in this project was to get the equipment um, to begin hardware um, studies. So this can be kind of tricky because ant antique electronics are subject to fashion availability due to limited production runs. So niche electronics like the, the Fisher-Price Pixel Vision 2000 children's video camera and the obscure Atari video mis uh, music system color organ are used for things like circuit, bend circuit bending experiments, which usually takes them out of, uh, out of play. But in this case, the Robot 400 is uh, a ham radio hobbyist uh, device. And so my concern was limited production runs and then you know resultant um, availability through attrition. So in this, in this way, there tends to be kind of a set pool of equipment that degrades over time, um, you know, with uh, the remaining circulation being resold units, which leads me to eBay. Um, so fortunately, eBay has a large enough uh, community that uh, so scan television, uh, television transceivers are occasionally available. And uh, it took me about four years of auction activity to um, find six units at uh, $50 a piece, which was amazing. <laughs> so, but this is actually, this is much less than the $2,500 a unit that they were new, um, that Bill Bartley told me. And this, of course, you know, made this project much more viable. Um, so once I got the tran uh, transceivers, I had to learn them. But before I engaged in the learning, some thought regarding the notion of methodologies and media arch archaeology to me is in order. So. Uh, for me, understanding the media archaeology of slow scan television requires unearthing its technological underpinnings. So, in the case of slow scan, there's ways to emulate signal decoding through um, software uh, software decoding here, like um, uh, like the software on on the on the screen. But this doesn't leave certain issues, um, you know, un, uh, unsolved um, because even though the software can decode signals. You know, the quality of the Id image computationally is really inauthentic. Um, and that brings up questions of its own. But while you decode the signal, you know, on a pixel by pixel uh, display in the software, you can see here it's just a small, sharp image on a screen that you have to capture in certain ways. And it doesn't have any of the wonderful blurry video artifacting that cathode ray screens have. Um, so, you know, it leaves something to be said for the experience. So it's for this reason, my initial study um, would have to involve analog methods of encoding and decoding to preserve the experiential um, quality of the, uh, of the media. So, um, learning the artifacts. There's a moment when the media archaeologist seeking to engage the subject from an embodied applied perspective is confronted with the technological artifacts sitting before them on the table. Here, the endeavor for me is no longer historical arranging of evidence and records in the decoding of archives, but the discovery of critical objects. So engaging hardware studies can uh, reveal greater context about the artifact, and in the case of the art media archaeologist, multidisciplinary approaches like hardware, software studies, emulation, evisceration, um, and codecking may be employed. This methodology can be distantly compared to uh, two other examples of historical technologies, uh, the, the Greek, um, here we go, the Greek Antikythera device 
and um, <laughs> Babbage's uh, different engine too. Um, so um, I have a little bit of a discussion of that, but I'll go forward. Um, so for me, the matter of hardware studies as foundation uh, drew upon my knowledge of electrical engineer because that's my undergrad background. So I dug into schematic diagrams and operational manuals of the Robot 400 slow scan transceiver and learned how to fix them. So uh, for me, the technical function of the device reveals many aspects of the situation where the device operated and as the electronics and architecture reveal for me much about the era as Bogost and Monfort's, uh, you know, talked about in their study of the uh, Atari 2600 video game platform racing the beam. So for me, I was, you know, I, I went into the guts of these things and saw that, you know, the manufacturer was parallel to early uh, consumer uh, computers like the Atari 800 and Commodore 64 during the waning years of first wave computer gaming. Actually, that's I was also a uh, computer technician for Tandy Computers at the time, so. Mm -hmm. And um, so this situated things in a sort of a first golden age of 70s and 80s hobbyist electronics uh, during which, you know, the telematic um, art genre fl uh, flourished. So in learning the operation of an artifact, the media archeologist sets about the task of learning its operation. So in the case of the slow scan research, I actually sent a robot 400 to Doug Jarvis o over in uh, Victoria to try to reenact the, some of the historical experiments, which, eh, you know, eh. so um, didn't work as well as I wanted. But to kind of mitigate that, what I did is that I set up two units in a send-receive configuration, you know, eliminating the use of a ham radio or, or now I'm using Skype connections, actually. And um, with direct wires. So I want to tell you that early electronics were not plug and play. Um, and it required knowledge that I you know, knew how to use these things. And I made custom wires and accessories for the equipment myself. And it took maybe about a year of sessions to consistently learn the equipment to the point where I could really set up things to get a reliable uh, encoding and decoding of the signal as well as uh, getting the proper adjustments. So, recoding history, subterranean TV, homesick uh, blues. So, once I got the equipment, learned how to uh, operate it to proficiency, the next one was to create an operational test of executing, decoding, and archiving a slow scan television video art piece. I considered several things. What form would uh, lend itself to the time-lapse nature of uh, the form of one frame transmitting every seven seconds and the translation the crude black and white? So what I did is that I executed a work called Subterranean Slow Scan Television Homesick Blues, which is based on a radical reformatting of the Bob Dylan performance in D.A. Pennebaker's film Don't Look Back. So what I did is I, I took each cue card from Subterranean Homesick Blues and sampled it as a freeze frame and uh, lasting seven seconds and re-edited in Premiere to maintain a temporal continuity so that it captured properly. So I took the full motion opening and close and created a, a digital movie file and fed it into the Robot 400. So although the original slow scan um, art performances that I'd studied were done with black and white Viticon camera cameras during live performances, you know, I wanted to minimize the number of variables during the first experiment. So, um, so the edited video was fed into a Robot 400 and digitized first with a uh, Flip Mino personal handheld camera live from a security monitor to experiment with lo-fi gestures um, and then captured with a uh, digital capture device. So although a video capture direct to computer would be more accurate, but I felt that hiding under a blanket with a security monitor with a handheld video camera kind of got more of the uh, spirit of the time. So, and this is what I showed at Transmedia. So, and then I uh, extended the um, soundtrack to the resulting eight minutes and 40 seconds using Tom Paul's time stretcher software. And it went in and out of synchrony, which was really fun. So now that I got a functional creation of a slow scan television video piece, you know, as a complete part of my research, I could go around to uh, set about the reconstruction of historical signal archives into video. So 
Jarvis and Davis and the other presentation dealt primarily with Bill Bartlett and Hank Bull and, uh, and the work at Open Space and Western Front. So these would be the first places I'd look. My goal was to find um, recorded audio data signal uh, from original performances of the 70s and 80s that I'd stream into the uh, resurrected equipment. So I'd, um, I'd go there and visit Western Front. They had great archives, wonderful ephemera, but they only had like five faintly audible tapes of original audio streams. But basically, ho uh, hopefully, uh, wonderfully, that uh, Hank Bull was uh, going through, and we had lunch, and uh, um, I told him that I could, uh, because of uh, my depth of research, I could pretty much determine the uh, model of slow scan transceiver by, by ear now. Um, he went, wow, and uh, gave me about five hours of performances from Vancouver, Bob Adrian's 24, and uh, Bob Adrian's 24 Hours, which was at, uh, Ar which was at uh, Ars Electronica in 1982. Within two weeks, I had wave audio files digitized from, the, uh, uh, from Hank's uh, archive files and played them into the receivers, and it worked. Um, so for me, the um, media archaeological work of uh, obtaining, decrypting, and learning processes embedded in the uh, technology resulted in being able to easily encode and, and encrypt um, slow scan audio data streams into more traditional practices of migration and archival. So for me, this engendered a, a deeper understanding of the medium and its processes, giving me a greater context in, in constructing archival discourses. So deco decoding the records. Uh, Bull, Hawking, Bartlett, and the uh, slow scan television uh, open source archive. So decoding b uh, Bull's data streams in addition to inclusion in my uh, upcoming archive supported in his connection exhibition um, going on here right now um, basically contained uh, excerpts of numerous performances, including Bob Adrian's World in 24 Hours for Ars Electronica 1982 and two of the Vancouver interventions. So according to records in Heidi Grumman's art communication, Vancouver uh, took place yearly from 19, uh, 1979-1983, utilized slow scan in 1980 to 1983, and included um, Grunman, Bull, Bartlett, and Adrian, and included many others. So the, uh, the World in 24 Hours was centered at Ars Electronica in 1982, including 16 cities in three continents over 24 hours, noon to noon uh, from uh, September 27th to 28th, 1982. 24 not only used slow scan, but fax, computer time, is, uh, time sharing over the IP Sharp network, and sound transmission. Linz had three telephone lines available, meaning there could be as many as three interventions happening at any one time, and these uh, lasted one half hour and included uh, people we all know now, like you know, like Hank and Sarah Dickinson, um, Roy, Roy Ascot, uh, Kabata, and uh, a lot of other f uh, other people. So another set of interventions uh, in which uh, in Bull's archive is uh, excerpts from the multiple Vancouver performances in which 24 is part of. Uh, Vancouver did not only include Vienna and Vancouver, but Berlin, Warsaw, Tokyo, Pender Island, and a lot of other places, including performance, live video, and stream, and at that time, the equivalent of streamed music. So the importance of this archive for me is that uh, I, at the moment, uh, I have it basically on my Dropbox available as a, as a uh, pre-open source archive site. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to have... Uh, I'm going to be launching the uh, archive site in early um, 2016 with documentary documentation of these performances and each decoded video as part of this. So, yeah, what is this open slow scan television archive? Um, so once I've gotten this the, done, the hardware studies and signal studies, and applying it to the process of unearthing the signal back into video form, what do I do then? So I was faced with you know, Foucaultian issues of record, the archive, and whether antiquarianism is appropriate under a media archaeological framework at all. But, um, but in talking to UC Parika, um, he said that you know, as far as media archaeology is concerned, it's many sets of methods don't or really shouldn't be applied all at once. So it's fine. Um, so 
<laughs> don't do it all at once, Patrick. It's really, seriously. So, okay. So for me, it's reasonable to understand that the so open slow scan archive will constitute a work in process. So in my research um, leading to this archival project, including, I'm figuring it's probably going to take me a decade at least, the architectonic of the research will be research will be represented at the archive. While the archive doesn't have a physical component at that time, unless you want to come to Sharjah to uh, work with the equipment, um, I'd love to have you. But um, <laughs> I'd like to see anybody out there. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've got about three or four paragraphs. Okay. Great. So um, and um, so. Um, I'll, I'll have the equipment uh, available for decoding uh, online and um, you know, through uh, correspondence and print records will also be available on the archive website. So the other thing that we've been dealing with is ownership. I'll try to wrap things up here pretty quick is that uh, um, some of the archive, uh, some of the other archives like, uh, like Vivo and open source, some of them have been a little mixed on the subject, but I'm negotiating with them. So for the moment, Hank, Bill and, and Ralph Hawking are in agreement with me that the uh, media needs to be available for research. And at the moment, I'm instituting uh, Creative Commons attribution and non-commercial licenses on all the material. And if anybody wants to show the work directly, you know, I'm basically saying contact the artists. So beyond this, the archive is uh, intended to um, have open free access to the contents for global researchers dealing with slow scan TV, which is really, in my opinion, an important genre that really isn't seen very much. So I'll have the archives and uh, records uh, hopefully available probably January or February of 2016. So to wrap up, um, what I was looking at is kind of a media archaeological and historiographical approach to the scholarship of slow scan television through uh, the application of media archaeological um, principles. So um, more than, you know, a, just a straight history of slow scan TV art, which I'd like to talk about later. But um, through my research of discovery, training, and decoding um, with slow scan te technology and the art created by it, the foundations for me of ongoing work related relating to uh, art historical inquiry about this genre you know, hopefully can take place in a much larger uh, sense. So the formation of the archive for me creates fundamental underpinnings upon which the, um, the historical research of slow scan television can take place. So in closing, the, the process and results described in this research uh, reveal multi-tiered sets of methods uh, involved in creating the slow scan TV open archive from the technology workflows, decoding and archiving of the um, the media and its derivative artifacts. While the archive in itself is thought to be a project with research initiatives uh, planned uh, provisionally for Vancouver, Victoria, Ithaca, and Dundee, um, its nature uh, will follow the plural models put forth by the foundations of media archaeology. This is so that researchers can be uh, can study the artifacts, ephemera, and media. In establishing the SoScan Television archi Open Source Archive, uh, I hope to use open models to avails slow scan television art to a much larger a larger audience thank you thank, thank you very much patrick for an important <coughs> synopsis of a, of a forgotten form um why don't you stay sitting for a second there may be some questions uh are there any questions from the audience no no yes over here uh yes. do we need to pass okay. a microphone to the oh. <coughs> Tons of questions. Um, uh, do you have anything you can show us? Any video that you could show us? Um, <laughs> yes, actually. And I can I come to Sharpa and yeah, make stuff with you? Sure, you can. <laughs> you know, if if you can, you know. Oops. What? I'll apply oh for a shirt. Okay. Uh, I think I might have just done something screwy. Can we bring up a, a browser? So will there be video available on your uh, your archive to see? Like, Pardon me? Will we be able to see? Yes, yes, yes. And then what I'm hoping to, uh, what uh, I'm going to be working with Hank on is to, um, you know, in each of the, in each of my um, archival videos have a, um, you know, have like a, a, a shot list and context yes. and uh, yes. to basically give the uh, 
um, give the larger context on, on things. Are you going to be looking at uh, slow uh, uses of slow cam for actually stable video art or film, like as an effect? Because I was actually talking to someone who who was doing a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. He was a documentary filmmaker, and so he was actually using a slow scan at Sheridan. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I can get you in touch with him if did that interests you. Okay, did, did, I, did I just mess things up terribly? <laughs> so. so um, just another question from anything else from the audience? Uh, I've got a couple of observations, mm -hmm. uh, inner questions in, in different sorts of ways. Um, I was interested that you that you referenced the telematic movement, mm -hmm. the telematic art movement, uh, as the site of use of this slow scan television work, and not the sort of um, video installation right. art tradition, which of course there was plenty of as well. Certainly, but it's important. You know, it's important. I mean, I I, I was involved in some of those things peripherally, and mm -hmm. and the kit. And it's important to understand from the point of view of today's digital tools that, you know, the kit that people like Bob Adrian mm -hmm. were using consisted of a 300 board acoustic modem, a fax machine, yeah. and a robot, yeah. a so-called right. robot, the slow scan. Uh, the, the, yeah. the, the, the way, and I think what's important about this is the way that experimental art of this sort kludges together no, 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 um, no, technological assemblages in order to model a kind of technology that doesn't yet exist. And I think we see that in the history of media art experimentation over and over again since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, I think all of us have, have probably lived through this in one way or another, that, that the, the reason that artists kind of colonize technologies and, 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 and hack technologies is because they have a vision for some kind of a um, socio-technical complex that, that doesn't yet exist. And so it always looks kludgy and, and, mm -hmm. and, and hacked together because it is, yes. because it doesn't exist yet. Anyway, that's just my exactly. editorial. The other thing, of course, to remember is that, is that Apollo 11 used slow scan TV. Of course. So this was cutting edge technology yeah. at the time. And, <laughs> and actually I've got slow scan archives from the, uh, from the Voyager 1 uh, project. So, you know, this is all really amazing stuff, amazing stuff that really goes to the core of technoculture, you know, and so Yeah, and it's and in terms of a sort of trajectory from from the sort of, of technological art practice, you know, from the from the 50s or early 60s through to the the digital era, this 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 moment, I think, is really. I agree with you. It's really yeah. it's really historically crucial and often forgotten. We yeah. we often think about the art and technology movement and then video art and then suddenly it's computers. Yeah. But but this stuff really prevision and pre envisions the, yeah. the 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 internet in in um, you know along of course I mentioned on, on Saturday the other the yeah. or the other day uh, a hole in space which is absolutely. Um, uh, visionary piece of work about about long distance real time telematics. Yeah, yeah, it's uh just just briefly this is let's see here. This is this is what it looks like. So that's 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 what I got from hiding under the blanket with a. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, that, Simon, don't you agree that 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 kind of, um, uh, that 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 well that that sort of as you said you know kludginess you know is, is sort of puts together kind of the zeitgeist, don't you think? Uh, I think that's nostalgia. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> well, you know, or you know, it's sort of like what Corey Archangel was sort of saying is a nostalgia for a time that I never uh, never was part of. You know, so. Mm -hmm. But anyway, anybody else? Uh, well, well, thank you very much, okay, Patrick. Uh, and and now I'd like to introduce Shintaro Miyazaki. Uh, sorry, Miyazaki, yes.
30 hours, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so, so thanks for coming. I must excuse uh, for my strange English. Um, it's a strange accent, uh, a mixture between Japanese accent and Swiss German, so <laughs> it's a bit uh, strange. Okay, so the title of my talk, as you can see, is Psychedelic Circuitry, uh, 1980, uh, 1880 to 1980, Signals Between Esotericism, New Religion, Engineering, and Art. And it's, I know it's quite broad, and I will present some very loosely connected um, aspects. And uh, so um, technologies based on electricity have uh, since a long time been uh, the source for creative and uh, imaginative and uh, esoteric cultures. And uh, yeah, and uh, I will try to do this kind of um, presentation with this mini structure. And first of all, of course, I would like to ask or a little bit define what I mean by psychedelic circuitry. So the term psychedelic is a combination of ancient Greek delos, with which means like clear or manifest, and with uh, psyche, which means uh, breath and life and soul. So in conventional usage, of course, it's associated with psychoactive uh, drugs, such as LSD or uh, psilocybin, uh, which have been regarded as mind opening or uh, expanding the consciousness by causing hallucinatory effects in human perception. And so in a broad sense, maybe psychedelic media um, would then address all sorts of media gadgetry, uh, which are measuring and maybe thus revealing, clarifying or manifesting some aspects of psychic or psychological processes. So kind of mind opening in a sense for more like in a media reflective sense maybe. So um, psychedelic circuitry is then a kind of a conceptual framework for me for describing circuit-based thinking in psychology, which not only reveal the interdependence of knowledge thinking models and uh, circuitry, but also uh, involve some sort of media reflectivity. So the concept of circuitry or circuits um, has been mostly discussed, of course, in historical studies on cybernetics and um, system dynamics in context of history of science and media history and archaeology. And, um, but I think uh, studying circuitry also involves some, um, of course, uh, cultural and social aspects and what I want to hint at uh, also religious and kind of imaginary aspects. So what you see here is, um, I want to say like that circuits have not only been used to describe um, electrical or electronic networks, devices and media, but also have been applied as kind of models, epistemic models um, uh, for acoustic and all sorts of chemical, biological and uh, psychological processes. So you can see here on the right side, this is a famous model of the, uh, by the, the Hodgkin-Huxley model of the uh, action potential. And it's a so-called equivalence circuit. So it's like uh, trying to model the, 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 uh, the, the nerve pulse with um, a kind of a rain, with a network of uh, condensers, uh, condensers uh, capacitors, and uh, resistors. And so interestingly, this kind of, um, and this is 1952, I think. And um, on, the, on the right side, uh, yeah, so this is on the left side. On the right side, you can see the, um, an early uh, representation of uh, so-called artificial lines. So that's in context of the development of the Atlantic um, telegraph cable in the 1860s. And, uh, so these were kind of used as uh, kind of models for the, for the Atlantic cable. And uh, so resistor capacitor circuits uh, were used to model the transmission char characteristics of uh, long cables, thus they are kind of so-called artificial lines. And um, since then, so since like 1860, I think, they have been uh, applying these kind of models also like for modeling uh, living membranes and then also neurons. Um, and all 
kind of uh, connections between electrodes and flesh. So this is kind of my background and also kind of a topic of mine. And um, so now I want to like more like playfully try to connect, um, you know, uh, these uh, three different um, realms. So yeah, this is. So I'm come to some historical aspects, and these are kind of very loosely connected. So. Um, you see some uh, representation of model uh, spiritualism here around 1850. Uh, and on the left side, you can see kind of a circuit of human bodies, people trying to communicate with ghosts, and as uh, elaborated by a German media historian what called uh, Wolfgang Hagen, uh, these kind of sessions became popular with the dawn of telegraphy. So as you know, th there were also famous so-called fox wrappings, of the Fox sisters uh, were the most famous uh, of these narrations. And uh, the, co the, the communication with the ghost was sort of telegraphic. So knocking two times means yes, knocking one time, no. Okay. So and then um, also this kind of circuitry was also um, used by uh, Sigmund Freud for uh, modeling the neural uh, mechanism of repression. And this is an early work which is kind of unknown in, and, and not so much published uh, upon. And it's kind of a pseudo scientific circuit with uh, symbols resembling those of these resistors I, I was showing before. A um, little bit later, psychologists like Carl Jung and Frederick Patterson uh, were amongst the early practitioners of uh, psychogalvanics, which is the use of galvanometers to measure the body resistance. And these are also, for me, early attempts to, uh, or one of the first attempts to measure electrodermal activity, which is the property of the human body that causes uh, continuous variation in the electrical characteristics of the skin. And interesting, of course, this is uh, connected to the uh, media hi history or archaeology of the uh, lie detector. And I'm also I'm doing um, a workshop where we try to, uh, this comes also later on, we try to rebuild a e-meter uh, uh, of Scientological e-meter where also it's also using this kind of uh, skin resistance um, technique. So meanwhile, of course, uh, vacuum tubes evolved and uh, um, electrophysiology became more popular and you see here these early uh, measurement um, circuits to measure the all sorts of elect bioelectrical activity in the human body. And so, uh, of course, with the um, emergence of radio and uh, telephone, all sorts of uh, strange um, practices uh, evolve. So um, this is a diagnoscopy founded by Zakhar Biski and uh, um, Cornelius Borg, uh, another German historian, uh, has been writing about that uh, a lot. Also, stuff like this, um, electrotherapy, uh, the, uh, the regenerator by Otto Overbeck, or like uh, so-called biocircuits by uh, Leon E. Eman. And uh, this, is, um, this is interesting because it in involves no batteries. So, um, and only connects the body parts. Um, and then I think uh, there is even uh, artistic work uh, kind, and kind of trying to, to rebuild this uh, circuit by uh, Pia, who is also sitting here. So, and during the same decade, um, of course, uh, more um, stuff happens. <laughs> and uh, um, Harold Stephen Black was experimental with, uh, experimenting with amplification systems in the laboratory of Western Electronic electrics, electric, which became later the, the Bell Telephone Laboratories, and he was testing ways to improve the ampli amplification quality for uh, speech transmission, and then somehow uh, found, found out this principle of negative feedback, which is very important for cybernetics. And uh, it was kind of highly peculiar because people tried to avoid feedback, but he was kind of using the, the, the negative feedback. So this is not a psychedelic circuit as such, but uh, we'll find uh, application then soon 
uh, in some in these kind of uh, cybernetic circuitries. So then you have also the EEG and the measurement of, it's also kind of uh, trying to measure psychic energy um, by uh, its kind of inventor, Hans Berger, and then he got kind of more um, um, referred to by Nobel Prize winner Edgar Adrian, who then uh, referred to Ber um, Berger's work and called the specific rhythms the, uh, the alpha waves uh, Berger rhythms. But Berger he himself was more interested in not measuring the brain waves, but more like this, this psychic energy. And then um, you have this, uh, of course, the um, evolvement of experimental psychology, which then um, also is for me a sign that uh, this psychogalvanics, which uh, got like a subchapter in this um, very influential monograph by Robert S. Uh, Woodsworth, and um, this the, the psychogalvanics got kind of very popular as a, as a um, method in experimental psychology. Stuff like this. And um, this is uh, making a, a recursion towards this uh, negative feedback um, uh, principle by Black. So this is uh, a, a early work by Gray Walter, uh, also a cybernetician, uh, which then, this is the, the flicker thing. So um, you can see the, the lamp, which is making a strobe effect, and uh, it's, a me it's measuring at the same time the EEG and you can see also this uh, the cloud, the subjective experience. And this is forming a kind of a feedback loop again um, between the, the brain waves, which, were, uh, which are induced by the uh, strobe lights, and, and then kind of trigger again uh, the, the brain waves and so on. And this became later on described by um, by uh, Gray Walter, uh, this British cybernetician, um, in his famous or popular book, uh, The Living Brain. And this The Living Brain then influences uh, kind of beat generation writers such as uh, William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, and uh, Richard Teitelbaum to use EEG as a kind of artistic uh, thing or use a very simple DIY um, kind of rebuilds uh, of the flicker machine by making the dream machine, which is just like turn, a, a turning lamp and so on. Around the same time, uh, 50s, um, we have this uh, the E-meter, which is then kind of invented by uh, Volney Mattison, and then uh, uh, the, the Scientologist um, Ron Hubbard is uh, getting gets to know about this technology and he, he uses his, uh, it uses it as a kind of a instrument for his new uh, religion. And inter interestingly, in this electropsychometer, um, so if you read this, th there is a, it's online, in on I think on archive.org or somebody put it online, and you can find the reference to this experimental psychology book. Um, by which I mentioned earlier. So this is kind of the connection for me. And basically this is also a sort of um, differential amp amplifier system. So it's also connected to the, uh, the negative feedback amplification by, uh, by Howard uh, Black. Um, this is a famous, another context of, or maybe the real context of psychedelic circuits. Uh, so like the, uh, the usage of tape delay, um, which is kind of also forming a time delay feedback um, circuit. Um, so you it's a kind of an echo, echo effect, uh, which was used heavily by, uh, by uh, in, in San Francisco as a kind of first uh, by, uh, by um, avant-garde um, musicians, composers. Uh, such as um, Terry Riley also, and others, and also at this uh, San Francisco Tape Music Center, the, uh, the, the, the synthesizer, the model, uh, the, how to say, the, the, the analog synthesizer was invented. And, uh, the, but they used also these tape delay uh, machines. And uh, the tape delay machine was, for example, uh, uh, iconic, uh, very important technology for the 
inside the bus of uh, further, the bus called further, uh, used by Ken Kesey, and they constantly uh, took LSD and then uh, played with this uh, uh, delay machine and were really kind of listening to their, their own voice and making their, their sessions. And yeah, these are kind of uh, other events connected to this uh, um, electronic circuitry, which is for me as kind of uh, somebody who didn't know about this at all, uh, very interesting because, you know, for me the image of hippies is very different. It's like going to nature and uh, very non-electronic, uh, but this kind, this trip festival, it, it has on, the on, in on its poster, it has an oscillograph. So I uh, oscilloscope, so uh, it's kind of, uh, it's for me it's very fascinating. And they talk about electronic performance as a new medium of con communication and uh, high energy experiments and this kind of stuff. So and soon this got also again uh, popularized uh, and you see here like uh, the this psychedelic strobe light um, thing uh, on uh, popular electronics. So it got also taken up by a different context, which was that this more connected to this hammer radio maybe context, which then took got interested also sorry in the um, in in this uh, psychedelic movement because of its tech uh, affinity for technology. So I move on. Um, we have at the same time. Uh, this is something which I. Uh, it's not in the text. Uh, I got uh, by a talk yes, uh, the um, Thursday by Elena um, um, the connection between uh, psychedelic circuitry and John C. Lilly. Of course, it's very, uh, I know about, I knew about him, but I think it's um, a good example also to see um, these, um, these circ feedback circuits again and the idea of meta programming by, um, by using uh, different uh, media not only drugs. And interestingly, Lily has been working, and that's ma maybe my point, on uh, electrode stimulation very early on and has been using also these kind of uh, equivalent, equivalent circuits uh, to, to model uh, the, um, the medium between electrode and uh, wetware or flesh and, uh, or like um, neurons. And there is a kind of a, um, in certain, um, Communities like uh, the, the electrophysiological community, a uh, very influential paper by uh, Li Lily, uh, recommending a biphasic uh, impulse for stimulating uh, brain neurons. And uh, this is important for, for um, the history of um, cochlear implants, also, which I was uh, looking at a, li a bit. Uh. So, yeah, this is the meta programming and the uh, um, psychedelic circuitry between uh, another example. So uh, yeah, I have a lot of these examples and the here this is uh, William Burroughs with the E-meter and he was kind of interested in, um, in Scientology between 1959 and uh, the early 17th, 70s and um, he thought like um, Scientology might help to combat uh, a control society but however, uh, as we know, um, he became, or it's, um, Scientology is very authoritarian, so he can then started to uh, criticize, it, so, uh, criticize it, of course. And uh, in the 1970s, then he published several uh, considered statements on, on its met methods. But here you can see kind of a late uh, picture using him, uh, him using the, the E-meter as kind of a maybe imaginary or kind of a toy uh, and also it has also of course connections to um, the quantified self movement uh, now could do if you want it's another uh, late example of this um, things so to summarize a little bit uh, so far we have been looking at uh, maybe modes uh, of um, transduction transmission and amplification and from the beginning of the 1970s, there is kind of a change towards concepts involving the then upcoming new media um, paradigms, such as like computation and also above all uh, distributed networks. So what we 
relate to the internet somehow. So with the emergence of this uh, counterculture, I was, uh, tried, I was trying to refer a little bit also old concep concepts of body networks were um, coming up. And um, at the same time, you know, you have the ARPANET and the ARPANET is very interested be interesting because it's, a it's one of the first, uh, or it's the first distributed uh, network and uh, you have also first distributed accidents and uh, kind of um, uh, unforeseen um, feedback loops which uh, you couldn't control and um, um, also uh, evoked some kind of imaginary in the scientists. Maybe not so like uh, esoteric, but they were kind of speaking about uh, it, it's complicated behavior or it's uh, unforeseen ability of the, of the, of the networks. And um, yeah, so you could do all kind of a connection there. And at the same time, you have another network, which is the network of uh, the limits of growth. And this is the kind of a model <laughs> of, of the world uh, in context of Jay Forrester's um, people. And uh, the limits of growth is a very famous monograph published by uh, the Club of Rome. And um, also here you have these kind of circuits, which my point is which go m further than the human now and go uh, get like planetary dimensions. So, and of course, then speaking about planetary dimensions, you have the Gaia hypothesis uh, by James uh, Lovelock and uh, also like a feedback system. Then finally, Timothy Le Leary proposes, and this is the end, my end example, uh, this uh, exo in exopsychology, a manual of the use of the human nervous system according to the instructions of, of the manual, um, published 1977, uh, and, and here are it's this is the so-called eight-circuit model of consciousness, and this is very peculiar and kind of strange, and of course pseudoscientific. And uh, alri already the first pages use the term terms such as uh, human nervous system, electromagnetic messages, electronic signals, neurons, cells. And uh, he writes sentences such as, I quote, the source of the suffering and scarcity which now threatens our humanity is not material, it is neuropolitical, end of quote. Another quote reads like this, I quote, the brain is a biochemical electric computer in which each nerve impulse acts as an information quanta or bit, end of quote. So this is very similar to Ray Kurzweil's transhumanism. And kind of he, this proposal uh, with the eight circuits is like, um, I quote, we have defined, uh, he has defined in his book, eight, eight periods or and 24 stages of neurological evolution as a didactic device to anticipate and to specify, to order, to personalize, to familiarize the immense post-symbolic metapersonal post-Newtonian energy fields we are to be imprinted. And uh, yeah, and so on. And this, the idea of imprint, imprinting is still, in my sense, um, not connected to the medium of uh, computation or networks, but he is thinking in the medium of film. So there's another passage he, he has like, uh, he uses the, the film uh, as kind of imprinting the d DNA code. Uh, in the, ne the, the DNA code and the, hum and, and the connection between the DNA and the uh, nervous system. And he uses the, uh, the metaphor of film. So, so far, these are kind of my very scat scattered thoughts um, of these psychedelic circuitry, which um, yeah, I was trying to connect a little bit. And uh, yeah, I would try to draw some conclusions very quick maybe because we're running out of time. So, um, yeah, um, so while the study of interference between art and technology, media art and uh, technology and the resulting and transdisciplinarity is the main focus of people like us, I suggest to include maybe and extend this dual relationship with a third component, uh, which is the role of the imaginary and of religious concepts and of fantasy and fiction. And uh, yeah, what, I think it's interesting to use this kind of uh, pseudoscience as a pole and uh, coordinate, not to dismiss, but to reuse as kind of a source 
of uh, um, scholarism or also of uh, research creation. And uh, yeah, so of course, adding a third component to A, R, and B technology means also to appreciate a third component, and it gets kind of chaotic and uh, nonlinear. And uh, this is the nature of uh, creative working, right? So uh, this enables both an approval and a critique of the also the interferences between making and expectation, making and our, our own imagination. And um, research creation, as I also define and uh, will follow here the concepts formulated by Brian Masumi and Erin Manning in their new book, uh, Sword in the Act. So research creation is just kind of a process beginning with long phases of chaos and then working towards uh, some, with some pragmatics of the useless, um, which slowly then bifurcate towards singular or um, only few crystallizations. So it's kind of similar to the diagram here. So yeah, so together with my colleague and friend Jamie Allen, I'm working, uh, working both of us in uh, Basel. We uh, try to explore this uh, kind of triangle and we conducted yesterday um, workshop. And we are doing again one uh, today at two o'clock, um, which uh, combines this kind of historical inquiry uh, inquiry, as I presented here, with um, all these loosely thoughts, with concrete building and struggling with the circuitry, which is also kind of important point, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's. It was for me. It was really an effort to learn how to edge this uh, PCB and uh, to put together or first even make this a schematic with eagle and so on. So making is not so easy, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, also, we want to try by making the, uh, try to close the loop and um, kind of play inside also um, the triangle between uh, art design, uh, art esoterics and technology. So yeah, thank you, that's my thoughts. Thanks very much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I'll ask for questions from the, from the floor. If yes, sir. I think the microphone is coming. You may already be across this, but I think you could actually uh, push it back into the 19th century more sub substantially. People like uh, Cromwell Varley, who was a mate of William Crookes, mm -hmm. who was a uh, telegrapher and also put mediums into circuits. Mm. Um, and also uh, du du uh, Duchesne, who put human faces into circuits. <laughs> so that's in the 1870s. So I think, yeah, that would, in, in, you might already be there, but that would enrich, I think, your 20th century narrative. Mm -hmm. That's my only comment. Nice point. Okay. Uh, yes, Patrick. Um, that was mind-blowing. Thank you. Uh, just about um, subtle bodies. How, how much... Um, do your case studies or your research, how, how much has you sort of brought up a slide um, relating to kind of more Eastern uh, concepts of, of the body? I'm just interested in, because um, most of your uh, examples are Western sort of historical. I'm wondering if you've come across any anything from elsewhere. Mm. I mean, uh, th those people were uh, reading a lot this, um, the Asian, um, um, these networks and referring to them a lot, yeah. There is a one work by a colleague of mine, um, uh, Paul Feigelfeld, um, who is working on uh, the connection between Norbert Wiener and uh, Chinese um, philosophy. And uh, um, like, uh, he was in China uh, Paul tells, um, writes and uh, he was kind of influenced. First of all, there was like, um, this is maybe not so connected to esoterics, uh, esotericism or religion, but the, the, the early notion of uh, the digital is Chinese, uh, according to him. But also like this thinking in networks, yeah, maybe influenced. This is kind of the audience, audience or kind of, yeah. His, his thesis he wants to try to prove. Mm -hmm. I, I'd also add to that that yeah. Stafford Beer, I understand, was a practitioner of tantric meditation 
and and Endless, right? But I want to go back to the other way. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, the idea that, you know, as a soul body, we've been going around this place where outside of the West takes you over before, um, you know, put us all to the side so that the body can just go through the soul journey and come through the material world. Mm. So I wonder if there is a difference in that, if that is a different pathway that we're actually coming from um, out elsewhere other than mm. the West. Mm. Mm. I, I Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'd like to cut in because it 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 it, uh, it 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 relates to a question that I wanted to raise. Um, what's happening there with with the sort of discovery of electricity and the increasing sophistication of electronics is that is that analog electronics becomes a representational system of some sort, although not a representational system in the way that we've come to understand it in the digital era, and. And these kind of um, bionic analogies for uh, you know the Hodgkin's uh, mm -hmm. circuits and then the, 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 the history is full of this stuff. Uh, in, in fact, the the analog electronic representation becomes a par the paradigmatic technology for the representation of of all kinds of systems, biological and and physical. And of course, m analog computing. Um, you know, establishes simple electronic circuits as direct analogs for for engineering equations and and this sort of thing. It's kind of it's a it's a truly fascinating kind of material philosophical phenomenon. Mm. The the because the way that the analog electronic circuits represent is not in the sense of symbols as we come to understand them in the digital era, but in terms of kind of Resonances and and um, uh, so yeah, circuits. You know, so this very concept of the circuit, right? I mean, does it does it arise out of analog analog electronics and become this powerful metaphor, which underlies feedback, right? Or 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 does the concept of the circuit inform analog electronics? I, I'm not quite sure of the history of that, but it, it's mm. you know. And the, the thing about the analog electronics is it's it's material and it's non it's non quantified in a way i mean it's n it's 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 non digital clearly you know there are flows and fluctuations and resonances and that's the language of uh, analog representation yeah sorry i I don't know. I mean, I'm interested yeah, in what you've got to say about that. Yeah, computing is highly interesting. And uh, I was influenced by uh, the lab, of course, of my PhD advisor, uh, Wolfgang Ernst, and he was working a lot with analog computing, and also Stefan Hölken, who has presented re yesterday his more digital uh, lab, but they have also like analog uh, computing stuff. And uh, it's kind of completely un un unknown or not so known as a, a historical context. But it was very popular until the 1970s, right? As as, as a scientific tool. Right. Scientific I mean, tools. it's not a question of being popular. It was the paradigm. Yeah, it was from the yeah. late 1800s through to the 1970s. Mm. You know, and we yeah. see this whenever we see a flow diagram or a or whatever from Freud's drawings to to Lilly's. Mm. They all, the, in in a sense, it underlies the history of cybernetics as well. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, sorry, question over there. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, right there. To add to this discussion about yeah, the material philosophy or history of um, the um, circuits, that in um, about material or not, because in relation to um, representations of the brain, for example, during the period of cybernetics in the 60s and 70s, it's when the brain got le the less material so you want um, but this has been written also by some historians of science like Michael Hagner so in this period you would actually not find so many localized versions of a brain where you would find the brain depicted with the localizations like a f physical brain but rather this systems representation and and it's interesting in in regard of this question when it does um, the system start with 
an analogic uh, material or before or how and, and there are some objects like the brain or maybe others in, in which could be considered in a long history and you might find periods of non-materiality and then maybe ask for the reasons why it's suddenly non-material and material in another time also yeah very interesting Patrick, you had, I think you had a point. Sorry, could, yeah, could, yeah, uh, I'm not sure that Patrick's microphone is working. No, it's give, not. It, give it a tap. There you oh, go. it is. Okay, great. Um, this is this this is actually getting into uh, earlier aspects of something that I've been very interested in. Is that so? When you when you get into Leary. You know, and uh, so one of my favorite books is um, Computers and Cyberculture, 1994. Um, and uh, what I'm what I'm wondering here is that when you, you know, in in your exploration from what I would call sort of like the, what I'd say the electronic transduct trans transductive era, and um, you know, and you know, like Ken Casey and the and the and the Mary Pranksters and all these sort of things that you're talking about, and then when we start getting into you know figures like uh, like like Leary, who are who are what I call bridge figures, you know, to the digital, and when he starts, you know, when he starts talking about computers as mind altering, a uh, mind altering device, and uh, you know, and one of the fathers of uh, cyberdelia, and so it's like, are you are you thinking of you know moving your research forward, you know, into this area because this is something that's of great interest to, to me, you know, in which. You know, you have the Mondo Mondo 2000 era. You have you know you know all all this great San Francisco, you know, early Silicon Silicon Valley uh, culture. You know, before things you know had turned into this stultifying wired CEO of the month sort of thing. You know. Yeah, I was I was uh, looking a little bit, of course, at the the Stuart Brand line. Yeah. So this is another connection between this uh, electro. Transduction <laughs> generation mm -hmm. and the uh, computer generation. Yeah. I actually, I'm not sure. I want to. I mean, huh? I, but I, I'm not. How many people he were here at SIGGRAPH 1989? Uh, I was at SIGGRAPH yeah. 1989, which happened to be the panel in which virtual reality came out to the technical community, and there was a panel, and uh, included Warren Robinette. Um, who, uh, uh, was Jaron part of it? Jaron Lanier yeah. and Timothy Leary. And on that panel, in front of, you know, s a couple of thousand computer nerds, Timothy Leary said, "Virtual reality is electronic acid." Okay. I quote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Dallas, 1989. Fantastic. Mm. <laughs> well, this brings me maybe to another comment because. I was in my PhD. I was looking at the the material sides of the digital or the computation. So of course, it's it the the it's kind of an ideology also, like the, that the everything gets transhuman or like immaterial. And still, the computer is of course a material thing, and it, it sends. For I was speaking about algorithms written wrongly uh, as musical rhythms, and they send out like electromagnetic uh, waves, and we can. Uh, we can listen to them and so on. Right. So this is another side which it's not so like like the hardware side. Of course, it's very popular, but uh, mm. this uh, the signal I think is in between the material a little bit and the digital. It's kind of a interesting realm uh, which could be explored more. Well, yeah, I, I don't actually. I quite I quite disagree. I see a, 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 a profound disjunction between. Um, between the analog and the digital, and I think you know that, that, that comparing the sort of biofeedback movements with the the quantified self movement of the present reveals the differences. Mm -hmm. And the difference, I think, you know, in a sense, that w one of the key differences is that those biofeedback mechanisms are, in fact, you know, instituting feedback circuits, whereas the quantified self movement is a, is a movement of of externalized Data collection, mm -hmm. right, w which is a kind of fundamentally completely different, uh, on ontologically yeah. different. 
happening. So uh, anyone else? Anyone else to join the conversation? Or I will um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, speakers. Really exciting talks. And, and uh, we'll, we'll conclude the session and amble over and see what else is going on in the other side of the room. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, speakers.